cooler back there, which will make them a little happier. We might have fans that off the motor. It's an hour out here. Maybe so. It's on automatic, but that fan does keep the stuff stirred, so that is a, maybe we can get that going. We want to um, look today, and if you don't mind, I'm going to try to teach more today instead of hardcore preaching. One reason is my uh, the message that I have written is more of a teaching message. The second reason is I'm not sure that my throat would hold up for some hardcore shucking and preaching. But now, you know what that means when I just said that, right? Yeah. Absolutely nothing. I mean, it doesn't mean anything at all. But I do want to, uh, this is, I'm going to preach part of this message this morning. I'm going to finish it tonight. So that means all of you have to be back tonight to hear the conclusion of this message. You're going to sit going, well, I wonder how this is. Well, you've got to come back tonight to figure out how it is. I want to ask you this question. Does your life make a difference? Flip over to the book of Romans chapter 8 verse 29. And then you want to flip over to Galatians chapter 4. Keep your finger in those two places. This, this is kind of just the foundation of text. I'm actually going to preach all of chapter 12 throughout today in Romans. Uh, so after I read our foundation text, then you can flip over to Romans chapter 12 and we'll get that all going. Everybody found it? Once again, it's so good to see you here. Next Sunday morning, you'll have to wear a jacket outside as we're celebrating homecoming. Uh, it's supposed to be lows in the 50s, and the, it'll be the perfect kind of singing for the Freemans to make you get hot. You know what I mean? So they're going to shout you happy, I am sure. Next Sunday morning, 10.30 is our kickoff time. Romans chapter 8, verse 29. Let me go ahead and read verse 28 as well to get started, okay? It says, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God and to them who are called according to His purpose. From whom, and listen, this is where we take the foundation. For whom He did foreknow, He also predestinated to be conformed, listen to this, to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. To be conformed to the image of His Son, meaning Jesus. Flip over now to Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4. I'm going to begin reading at verse number 4. And when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoptions of sons. And because you are sons, God hath sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore, you are no more a servant, but you are now a son. And if a, a son, then you're an heir of God through Christ. Howbeit then, when you knew not God, you did service unto them which by nature are no God. Let me say, read verse 8 again. Howbeit, when you knew not God, you did service unto them which by nature are no gods. In other words, when you didn't serve God, Jehovah God, you served those no-name gods, those, those gods that didn't matter. I mean, that was by nature what we did. Verse 9, but now, after you have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn you again to the weak and the beggarly elements, wherein do you desire again to go to bondage? Once you've been with the real God, how do you ever desire to go back to the old God? Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much that you've given us the greatest privilege ever, and that's to sit and worship and to get a word. And I just thank you, God, for this great church. I thank you, God, for a church that will endure the, the heat and the the, the tightness of a, of a sanctuary. Jesus, will you please make it well worth their effort this morning. I just pray that you bless in a very special, powerful way. Help our lives to make a difference in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As a pastor, I want to see my church and our members being transformed by the power of God. Amen. There's nothing greater than seeing a sinner, somebody walk in this church who is sick and sin, bound by the bondage of this world, come to the altar and get saved and begin to live a different life. That is awesome. To see how their attitudes change and their actions change and their thought patterns change. I love to see that transformation in people. But I also love to be able to see Christians who've been Christians for a long time begin to grow and mature and begin to change into what God wants them to be. I think it is so awesome when I look across and I see people that have been struggling for the last year and a half in their walk with Christ and they've had battle after battle and then all of a sudden it clicks. 
And now they're living more on the victorious side than they are the defeated side. They're living more on the, on the side of peace and the side of turmoil. And it's awesome to see how God transforms not only the sinner, but He also transforms the saints. Yeah. Amen? Amen? And I want us to be able to continue to grow and mature in the power and the presence of God. We should never reach a place where we go, but we've done all we can do. We're, yeah. at, the, we're at the perfect ripe old age and we're now mature. We need to continue. It should be an ever process of maturing in the power of God. Right. And in order to do that, we must have a concept of God's Word. And we must understand God wants to do a work in us no matter what stage of our lives we're in, right? right. And listen, and that transformation ought to be a visible sign. People ought to be able to see that you have changed. Yes. People ought to be able to know that you are no longer the same because you have been transformed by the Spirit of Christ. What is transformation? First of all, it is not about attaining a spiritual standard. It is not some huge spiritual standard we're going to live up to. It's not a checklist of good deeds that we must check off every day. It's not a strict obedience to the law. It's not being a copycat of the Christians that have gone before us. It's not about an apple tree changing into an orange tree. Anything on that list, when you mark that down, is this is what I want to do. I want to, I want to have a list of good deeds and I'm going to check them off. You'll always fall short and you'll always be discouraged. In your walk with Christ, if you're all, I'm going to try to live and be as good as Brother Bain is, you'll always fall short and you'll always be discouraged. When you're trying to say, I've got to have this strict obedience and I, I, I'm going to be obedient enough to where I know I'm going to heaven, I'm going to be obedient enough, I'm going to obey the law, obey the law, obey the law, obey the law. You always mess up and you always find yourself defeated all over again. And the most frustrating thing is when you're called to be an apple tree and you're doing everything you can to be an orange tree. Right. I, 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 I'm going to get transformed. I'm going to become the greatest orange tree ever. How? You're an apple tree. But we've got this concept of believing that I've got to change who I am and I've got to be transformed into something that I'm not. No, no, no. You don't have to be transformed into an orange tree when you're an apple tree. Here's what transformation is. <coughs> It is the apple tree growing up being the best apple tree and producing the best apples ever. Right. Amen. In other words, it's about you becoming the best you can be. It is about God taking what's inside of you, transforming it, and all of a sudden you're now the best producing apple tree ever. You're not worried about being an orange tree. You're not discouraged because you're not a cherry tree. You're not discouraged because you don't grow figs. You're happy that you're producing apples. Amen. Can everybody see that picture? Because so many times people in church get so discouraged because they're not like Brother Chris or they're not like Brother Bain or they're not like Brother Richard or they're not like Brother Ben. And we find ourselves so frustrated because we can't do that. Let me just use my own self. I'm not a carpenter. You've heard me say that and you know that. I'm not a builder. I'm not a mechanic. I pay somebody to do those things or I ask Adam to do. All right? I, 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 I can't do stuff like that. It's, I'm just not gifted. So at Hell House yesterday, when we started building the walls, it was senseless for me to try to grab a hammer and act like I knew what to do with it. When I use a hammer, I get laughed at because I choke up real high on it and pound like this. You know what I mean? I don't hold it at the bottom and swing real hard and it drives in one shot. Right? It's senseless for me to think I'm a carpenter. And it's also senseless for me to get discouraged because I look at Brother Russell and I look at right. Kevin and I look at Brother Rob and I look at all these people and Brother Bobby and Brother Norman and they're building and they're cutting and they're sawing and they're measuring. They're building walls. They're setting them up. When I'm sitting there going, no, I don't want it right here. I want it right here. Right. No, 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 no. I don't want it right there. I want it to follow this path. No, that's not the right angle. I want it to do this. No, you don't have to do this. I'm just going to, you know, that's what I do. I'm that mouth that gets on everybody's nerves. I'm just going to tell them how to do it. Right? Because I don't know how to do it. I just like to tell people how to do it. So it's not bad. I shouldn't get discouraged that I can't do something I'm not gifted to do. You know, I told you the story. But about 90 of you were not here that Sunday. With, with a, a Hurricane Opal, I was living in Andalusia. Uh, blew a tree off on my house and it knocked my side porch off. And Brother Johnny, no, not Johnny, Brother Sims, I can't remember his first name. Brother Sims was, uh, was a man and he was about 80 years old. He says, I'm going to fix your roof for you. I said, well, I'm going to help you. You're 80 years old. My Lord, I had to pay double because I was paying by the hour. I got in the way. I was up there on top of the roof holding on. Brother Johnny, or Brother Sims, maybe his name was Johnny. He's standing up swinging boards around his head, tossing and painting. And I'm, I'm, I'm like, oh dear God. Oh God. Oh God. The wind's blowing. Help me not to fall off the roof. Oh dear Jesus. And, 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 and Brother, Brother Sims is just, he's got this roof going. He's laughing at me, mocking me. I'm nailing uh, the, the, 
the, the tack screws in that's going to put the black stuff on top, you know, before you put shingles in. I'm ripping the black stuff all up, having to start over and having to bend, bend, I'm building down. Finally, I just said, I am in the way. His little old wife, about 76, named Miss Janice, helped him finish the job because I was in the way. I was in the way. And here's the thing. Did I get mocked at church? Oh, you better believe Brother Sims talked about me like I was the funniest creature ever trying to help him build. You know why? Because I was doing the wrong thing in my life. I was not doing, I was trying to be a cherry tree when I'm an apple tree. You're going to get so discouraged in life when you're trying to be something you're not. God wants you to simply be the best sanctified Holy Ghost filled you you can be. Amen. is recognizing God in your life. Yes. You've got to recognize there's a higher power working inside of you. You've got to recognize Jehovah lives inside of you. Right. Recognize that you're not alone. Recognize you're not walking in your own strength. You're not walking in your own ability. You're not walking in your own power. You've got a God living inside of you. Yes, You've got the great I am living on the inside. You've got the power, the authority, in the name of Jesus inside of you. Yes. But now once you recognize that power, you've got to begin to respond to God in your life. Mm -hmm. Here's what transformation is. I recognize God, but I also respond to God. Amen. You see, many people will recognize Him, but they never have a transformation because they only recognize Him and never respond to Him. In other words, when God says, I want you, you say, yes, sir. And when He says, I need you, you say, yes, sir. Right. When He says, I want you to jump, you say, ha, ha. You just do what God's called you to do. And once we recognize God in our life, you begin to respond. Right. Amen? Amen. Now listen, it's one reason people don't do this. We get stuck. We get stuck in our past. We feel condemned. We feel unworthy. After all, I've been a drug addict. I, I, I've had all these bad things. I've done all of this horrible stuff. I, I have horrible past. And we get so caught up. I know that you've heard it over and over again. But listen, you are saved by the grace and the blood of Jesus Christ. And He's calling you to do something special with your life. You don't live in condemnation. You live in the freedom of Jesus Christ. Don't allow the devil to keep you from transforming by saying, Okay, I can't do it because I'm too bad. You're not good now. But you're washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. You're saved. Now listen, when you were in sin, you didn't have a hard time offending people. When you were in sin, you didn't have a hard time telling people off. And you may not have a hard time doing that now. I hope it's harder now than it used to be. When you were in sin, you didn't care if you came home drunk and hurt everybody's feelings or physically or emotionally abused them. Because when you were in sin, you simply did not care. But all of a sudden, when you get in church, you become shy. Oh, I can't minister to my family. Why? You cursed them when you were drunk. Right. Amen. Why can't you bless them now that you're saved? Amen. 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 Oh, 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 yeah. Some of you are like, I got some visitors going, wrong day to come to church. Wrong day to come to church. <laughs> Why is it in your life when you get saved, you feel like you can't talk to anybody? You are, are worthy. Romans chapter 8 verse 1. There is now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made you free. Everybody say I'm free. I'm free. You're free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. God sent His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh for sin, condemning sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For they that after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. In other words, transformation starts when you walk out of your condemnation right. and you walk past your sin into the likeness of Christ. Right. We should strive to fulfill the will of Christ in our minds, our emotions, our spirits. We should desire to allow God to get glory out of every part of our life. Yes. And here's what I want to do tonight. Today, I'm going to give you the eight marks of transformation. I'm only going to give you four this morning because some of you are going, oh, there's no way. I know my pastor. He cannot preach an eight-point message. I'm going to preach the other four tonight. All right? That's why you're going to come back. If we, when I know that you're going to be useful to God, 
And I know that transformation is taking your place in your life. You've got to surrender. Wow. Yeah. You must be willing to surrender everything to Christ. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. We're to present our bodies a living sacrifice. Now listen, Philip Nation writes this. The problem with living sacrifices is that they squirm on the altar. We do not want to lay there still and go, okay, Jesus, take me. Take all of me. Take every part of me. Take my thoughts. Take my actions. Yes. Take my will. Take my finances. Take my way. Amen. God, take, you, listen, we squirm and we try to avoid the knife. <laughs> A living sacrifice. Oh, no, I can't even stay up here. Oh, no, I can't give up this. Oh, no, I can't give up that. And God is saying, if you really want to be transformed, yes. surrender everything to God. Amen. 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 Our lives should be an example of God's agenda, not yours agenda. Amen. And listen, and quit trying to make a treaty with God. I'm going to give up cigarettes so I can get this blessing. God, I promise I'm going to quit watching that on the computer so I can get this blessing. God, I, I promise I'm not going to curse no more so you'll bless me with this. Uh, quit trying to sign a peace treaty with God and let Him take over your life. Amen. Listen, you don't have to worry about a, about a promise of giving up stuff. When you surrender your life, He'll take it all from you. Amen. Right. Amen. Woo. I said when you give it all up, He'll take it. Listen, when you surrender and you lay down and He says, all right, I'm going to take you as a living sacrifice, He will begin to take those things out of your life that doesn't need to be there. And you don't get mad. You don't try to hang on to it. You say, okay, God, take it. That's a sign of surrendering. Number two, you're going to surrender, and then you have to re have renewal. Renewal. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. You must renew your thinking. The transformation of the mind is a must if our lives will ever be affected. If you'll ever be good enough to go into the world, you've got to change the way you think. Now listen, here's I want let's see if you can see this slowly but surely. The thoughts of sin must be replaced with the mind of Christ. How many of you? Uh, no, don't raise your hand. Let me rephrase that. All of you and me, all of us are guilty of having things in our mind that is not the mind of Christ. Amen. Whether it's a negative thought, whether it's a lustful thought, whether it's a rude thought, whether it's a thought of hate, whether it's a thought of envy, whether whatever, and that thing has to get out of your mind, and the only way is to trans transform your mind by getting the mind of Christ. You've got to begin to think holy and righteous. Amen. You cannot have, you've got to have holy thoughts instead of perverted thoughts. <laughs> You gotta have thoughts of love instead of thoughts of hatred. You gotta have thoughts of peace instead of thoughts of war. You gotta have thoughts of resolve instead of thoughts of vindication. You gotta have thoughts of victory instead of thoughts of defeat. You've got to begin to allow the mind of Christ to take over what you think. Many of you are standing on the side of your victory and you're never crossing over into what God wants because you will not allow your mind to get under submission to Christ. Amen. God is saying, yes you can, yes you can. I'm giving you your power. I'm giving you strength. I'm going to make a miracle out of you. Yes, you can. You're going to do good. You're going to do great. You're going to be an overcomer. And your mind is going, you're a loser. You're a nobody. You can never do anything. You, you, oh, here comes Tim. Arr, I don't like Tim. Arr, Tim's a downer. Arr, Tim's a loser. Arr, Tim. Not really Tim. And, 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 and our mind begins to plague us. And all we have to do is say, okay, let me get in the mind of Christ. Oh, yes, I can be an overcomer. Yes, I can walk in peace. Yeah, yeah. Yes, I can walk in love. Yeah. Yes, I can have joy. Yes, I can have uh, 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 of comfort. Yes, I can have guidance. Yes, oh God, I am a king or a child of the king. Yes, oh God, I am bought by the blood of Jesus. Yes, I am worthy of, uh, of honor among my, my brethren. Oh, yes, oh God, I'm not the head or not the tail. I'm the head. Listen, you've got to begin to change how you think about you. A sign of transformation, a sign that you're useful to the kingdom is by allowing the mind of Christ to take over your mind. Don't sit on the sidelines waiting forever, not moving forward because your mind is telling you you can't. Amen. Number three, service. You've got to surrender. You've got to have a renewed mind. You've got to have service. We must embrace and activate our gifting. 
I'm going to say that again. We must embrace. Everybody say embrace. Embrace. And activate. Everybody say activate. Activate. Gifty. Romans chapter 12, verse 3. For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than you ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, all members have not the same office. So we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given unto us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the portion of faith. Or ministry, let us wait on our ministry. Well, that's a line right there. Let us wait on our ministry. Let us wait on our ministry. Everybody say that. Let Let us us wait wait on on our ministry. ministry. Or that he that teacheth on teaching. Or he that exhorteth on exhortation. He that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth with diligence. He that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. Listen, you are gifted to serve. If God saved you from your sin, He not only wants you to go to heaven, He wants you to take somebody with you. Everybody in this room has a responsibility to minister until you go to heaven. Amen. You are not to get saved and sanctified to fill up this church and sit there. Our job is to go. There's enough room for about 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 empty seats, 13, 14. There's 14 people that need to get here because there's room for them. Amen. Are you with me? Amen. So it is your job to be able to go into the world and find 14 people who you can bring to Christ. It is you got listen. What are you going to do? How am I going to understand that? You first understand you are called to do something. That's right. One size doesn't fit all. We're not all intended to do the same thing. That is not how God operates. We're all part of the body, but we're all different members in the body. So what are you going to have to do? First of all, if you're going to become a minister, if your life is going to make a difference, you've got to grow, mature, study, and pray. You've got to learn to stand on the foundation of God's Word. Amen. Now listen. I told you I'm teaching today and not preaching, so stay with me. Maybe it's too hot to teach, but I want want to get this. Because here's the thing. When when I got saved in 1986 at Washington Street United Methodist Church and I gave my life to Jesus Christ, I did not instantly begin a ministry. You have to grow, mature, learn, and you've got to get a foundation to where when you go out there, you're standing on something other than you. As a matter of fact, you're standing on something other than your faith. Now listen, that almost sounds contradictive because you're going to go into the world in faith. But when you get out there, your faith will be tested and you're going to go, I don't know about my faith, but I know what God's Word says. Because you're now standing on something a lot more solid than what you believe or don't believe. Whether you believe this or not, this is still the Word. If you're going to be a minister in your life, and, and, and listen, quit thinking pulpit ministry. If you're going to become, if your life is going to become effective, you have to develop your ministry. You've got to develop your giftedness. You have to wait for your ministry. Sometimes it may not seem natural at first, but you've got to learn, you've got to practice, and you've got to grow in your ministry. Some people who are called to preach do this. Oh, I'm just not the first people person. I can't get up in front of people. I don't like doing that. But no, 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 not you don't. But what happens is when God gets inside of you, yeah. He begins to make a transformation. And all of a sudden, what you don't like, all you go, oh, I can do this. Not because I like it, but because I'm empowered by God. And you begin to trust in the God in you, not in you. That's right. Amen. But you've got to develop that. Some people get so discouraged because, oh, no, no, no. Some people get frustrated because they're not willing to develop their ministry. Amen. They expect it to be dropping their lights. Now look, I look across this church and I'm so thankful for the massive growth we've had. But I also realize we are are pretty young in Christ church. And I see people who get kind of frustrated because they're not yet activated in their ministry. You've got to activate it, but then once you realize what you're gifted to do for the body of Christ, you've got to be willing to develop that, learn about it, study about it, practice it, do it. Listen, thank God this sermon today is not anything like the first sermon. Thank God this fourth church that I've pastored, or third, whatever number it is, is not anything like that first one I pastored. You know what I mean? It's it's something that I have learned and developed and developed, and I will continue from now until the Lord comes. If you're in my church 20 years from now, I will be somewhat different than I am today because of the learning process. You never stop the learning process. Figure out what you're gifted to do and begin to develop it. 
Because here's the deal. When all of us operate in our calling, the church runs like a well-oiled machine. That's right. When everybody in here does what they're called to do for the body of Christ, wow. All of a sudden, we have the ability to do more than we've ever imagined. And it's not, it's not bumping against bumps. It's just a smooth, easy ride. Now the devil's going to fight harder than ever. But then we just pull out the monster sword and stab the devil and cut his head off and hold up and have a victory shout because we're victorious over the enemy. Right. You'll always have the enemy, but God gives you the power to always to be an overcomer. But you've got to operate in your calling. Do what you're called to do. Amen? Amen. The body of Christ should not become weak and anemic. The body of Christ, a church that is weak and anemic, has a lot of people operating outside its calling. Mm -hmm. You with me? I'm almost done. i got seven minutes. I see some of you getting heavy-eyed. Take a nap today and come back tonight at six and I'll finish this. Listen. You must understand if this church will continue to progress and move in the power and the presence of God, and we're going to do, if we're going to re win this community and win this region, it's because all of us are developing our own giftedness and we're making it fit into the body. And as a result, we flow easy. But if we begin to compete for each other's gifts, we will become weak and anemic. This is not a competition. We're all in the same team. Amen. We're all trying to win the same victory, the same battle. We're all trying to win the same results. Don't compete against each other. Amen. Amen. You're going to surrender. You're going to renew. You're going to serve. And you're going to love. Number Amen. Four. If I've said it once, I've said it a thousand times. You've got to push love to the forefront. Amen. Love has got to be first. Mm -hmm. One reason, and the listen, and we use love for everything. In America, we have one lane, one word for love. Oh, I love my wife. Oh, I love my kids. Oh, I love Alabama Crimson Tide. Oh, man, I love donuts. We love everything. You can hear a little boy, old Gideon, get on the phone and go, he, 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 he's talked to this girl through Facebook and on the telephone three times, and now he's like, oh, well, I love you. <laughs> I sure, I love you more. Oh, I just don't want to love you. What are you talking about? <laughs> you know, we just love, love, love. You know, and, and so then we lose the real quality of real love right. of God because we don't really understand the meaning of effective love. Right. You must begin to understand the purity involved with Christian love. Let me say that again, and then I'm gonna close. And Sister Sandra, if you'll come and just get in position, so I think I gotta stop. <laughs> You've got to understand the importance of the purity of Christian love. Yes. Romans chapter 12, verse 9. Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Yes. Did you hear that? Abhor that which is evil. Cleave. Abhor. What does the word abhor mean? It means to regard with disgust and hatred. <laughs> You should, with disgust, avoid evil. Think about that language. With disgust and hatred. And here's what we do as a modern day church. Oh, that's not that bad. Oh, that's, well, you know, we have to accept everything now. And, oh, we have to love everybody now. Well, yeah, we love everybody, but we don't love their actions. Amen. The Bible says you should, it should nauseate you that evil is trying to overtake you. Right. Man. You should become almost sick to your stomach at the thought of evil. You abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affection one to another with brotherly love and honor preferring one another. We must remove hypocrisy. You can't do this to me. Come here, Alex. Everybody pretend this is a big old knife. <laughs> oh, Alex, I love you. <laughs> we hug and kiss while stabbing people in the back. Amen. Amen. That's hypocrisy. Is, uh... That is not God. has nothing to do with God. You cannot ever have an effective life when you have a knife in one hand and a pad in the other. Amen. You've got to get sanctified, holy, and righteous, and love with pure, unadulterated love. Just love like God loves. Amen? Amen. Amen. I'm closing. Sister Sandra, you may now start playing. John 13, 35 says, By this shall all men know that you're my disciples, if you have love one to another. 
Listen. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you flow in the gifts of the Spirit. Nope. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you wear a Christian t-shirt and listen to Christian music. Nope. nope. All men shall know that you are my disciples if you lay hands on the sick and they recover. Nope. All men shall know that you are the brethren of Christ if you speak in tongues. Nope. If you love one another. We get so caught up in so much. Look, I love the gifts of the Spirit. Thank God for them. Oh, one day all of those will cease, the Bible says, except for the greatest gift. And that's love. Amen. Prophecies will cease. Tongues will cease. All those things will cease. But love will always stand. Amen. If you're really going to live a life that will make a difference, it has to begin with you loving true love. Amen. Last but not least, Romans 12, 10. Be kindly affection one to another with brotherly love and honor preferring one another. You're called to prefer each other. You're called to honor. You're called to allow somebody else somebody else to get what you thought should have been yours. Somebody else gets noticed. Somebody else gets a pat on the back. Somebody else gets honored. Somebody else gets and that love inside of you rejoices that Tim got it and I did you know when you're really maturing in Christ and you're really at the place you need to be with Christ you don't get mad if Tim gets blessed you get glad right. Lord I've been praying for that blessing forever can't believe Tim got it that's not fair Tim got it oh Tim that old loser I don't even like Tim he's so mean and rude and crude he don't deserve that blessing no, really, you didn't because of the act, your reaction to him being blessed. <laughs> your reaction is revealing that you really didn't deserve that blessing. That's right. Because we should love one another with brotherly love, preferring one another. I wonder if you're in a place in your life that you can say, I'm effective for Christ. I only cover four of these. Tonight I'm going to cover four more. Please come back. Six o'clock, all right? It may rain. It's all right. It's rained before and it's going to rain again. So don't let the rain be a reason you stay home. If we get blown away, we'll all go together. All right? Tonight at six. But I ask you this morning, in the four that I covered, where are you? Where are you in the position to be able to know that you're doing what God has called you to do? Where are you in this position to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you're sold out to surrendering everything to God? Are you renewing your mind or is your mind saying negative, sinful thoughts? Do you have more thoughts of lust than you do of worship? Lord help us now. She's playing a beautiful song. I got to her because I'm about to become offensive. Do I dare go where I'm about to go? Well, I am. I look across this room. We got a lot of young adult men here. We're controlled a lot by lustful thinking. I don't. I don't everybody go. I can't believe he said that. The fact of the matter is, our mind thinks a lot about. No, I mean, there's been all kind of studies to prove that our minds are very shallow as men. <laughs> a few weeks ago, I preached that series on the gods of war. And one of the things was the god of lust you have to destroy. Amen. Your mind should not be controlled with lustful thoughts. Amen. This is going over like a big old herd of turtles. <laughs> You're thinking this. Why am I going here? I'm just having lustful thoughts about my wife. And that's all right to a degree. However, what happens is you're robbing God of giving you Christian, holy, righteous thoughts of how you can live for Him because you're wrapped up in what kind of new fandangle stuff you and your wife are going to do. Amen. I should have stopped in about 30 seconds. <laughs> Listen, I'm not trying to tell you the Bible says that your bedroom as a husband and wife is undefiled. You've got permission in there. However, I'm telling you, some of you are robbing God's fiction in your life because you're being controlled by lustful thoughts and you can't become victorious because you keep on trying to think of the latest, greatest, hottest thing you can do. Sexual. Amen. 
All right, I'm getting off of that. I think I got my point across. That's why we have children's church, so little kids don't have to hear that kind of stuff. Now listen, explain all that stuff to your, your, your babies when you get home. I won't ever forget I was at a church one time. We didn't have kids' church, and I got off on a sex subject, and I was blasting it hard. I mean, I was preaching, and the lady, the mama said, I sure wish you'd have told me you was going to preach this. I wouldn't have had my three kids on the front row. <laughs> I went, hey, somebody's got to teach them. Amen. Righteous and holy living. Amen. 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 Stand with me. you got to renew your mind. You've got to become the dedicated to service. A living sacrifice, and you've got to love. You've got to love with everything that is within your mind. Can I promo something here before we go to the altar service? Sister and Amy and I are going to be teaching a marriage class. I've not, I've not approved this for Brother Rob yet, but we were doing, we were going to do this after church on a different day, and that's just schedules. So we're going to use Sunday school. We're going to combine Sunday school classes, and we're going to teach a marriage class. On, on, on a, we've had a lot of requests for marriage counseling, so we're going to get together and just do that all. And if, if, if there's older adults, I don't want to steal from the older adult class, but we're going to really hit on some topics in, in, in a marriage for about about a five or six, seven week series that Sister and Amy and I will teach together. We'll separate ladies at times from men and so we can talk. And it's not going to be like a normal Sunday school class. It's going to get down to some nitty gritty stuff to make our marriages better. Alright? So that's coming. But in the meantime, let's talk about are you being effective in Christ?